When I uh, first heard the news on October 7th that there were hostages taken to Gaza and that Israel was trying to fend off hundreds of ter terrorists in her own territory, I knew that our lives would change permanently, that in many ways we would forever demarcate Jewish time as pre-October 7 and post-October 7. I said as much to the worshipers who gathered here on that Shabbat morning of Simchat Torah a mere few hours into the horror. I knew that the Middle East would never be the same. I knew that many thousands of people would die. I said that to the worshipers who gathered here on Simchat Torah. When I saw the frenzied madness of Gaza mobs taunting terrified mothers and kidnapped young women, their clothes still stained with blood from the sexual assaults they endured. And when I saw the mobs defiling corpses on Gaza streets, I knew that this coming war would be terrible for Israelis, but especially for Palestinians. I knew that their feverish ecstasy would soon turn to disconsolate misery. And I knew by October 10, when over 30 Harvard Palestine solidarity groups issued a statement justifying the attacks on Israel as legitimate resistance, with no response from university leaders, that the coming war would not only carry monumental consequences for Israel in the Middle East, but that it would pose a critical test for Western civilization itself. Do we still possess the moral clarity to distinguish between murder and self-defense, between terrorism and justice, between the bloodlust for war and the striving for coexistence? I felt that eventually the true tests would be on American campuses. First, because these great institutions of higher learning are supposed to represent the essential values of the United States, the training grounds of future leaders of our country in American principles. And second, I have been warning for years that our most elite campuses were becoming hotbeds of radical theories. Therefore, by definition, anti-Jewish and anti-Israel environments. I have warned for years now that social justice theories dividing people and assigning them moral worth by their immutable characteristics, the color of their skin, their gender, or sexual orientation were un-American, un-Jewish, illiberal, and never good for Jews. Jews will always find themselves on the wrong moral side of any theory that departs from Martin Luther King's definition of liberalism as he dreamt for the day when his four little children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And by the end of that first October 7th weekend, I feared that we would not withstand this test to Western civilization well. I was gobsmacked by students and faculty around the country who were condemning Israel for the attacks. It was incomprehensible to me. Ignoring decades of progress that sensitized us to victim blaming and shaming, and contrary to their own self-proclaimed principles, they blamed Israeli women and men for being the victims of sexual assaults. 
Their defense of Hamas in the name of what they called legitimate resistance meant in their eyes the 1,200 murdered Israelis were guilty. They were rightly slaughtered. That the 240 hostages, including babies and children, were rightly seized. They were guilty for living, or at least living there. I awaited the flood of statements from university presidents condemning Hamas. This was an easy moral case. Israel hadn't even begun to respond yet. Who in their right minds would be unwilling to condemn unprovoked murder, rape, kidnapping, torture, and vicious cruelty? These were university administrations that commented on every perceived microaggression every act that caused offense to one minority group or another, every violation of university codes of conduct. And what students in their right minds would not be distressed and outraged by hundreds of young people their age tortured and gunned down in an open-air concert embracing love and beauty. Many of their bodies burned, mutilated, and desecrated beyond recognition. I knew we were in trouble when we waited in vain. A small number of university presidents did issue statements and received piles of bile hate mail, but most did not. It signaled to me two highly worrying trends. First, that these radical identity-based ideologies have seized more of academia than even I fear. I thought, and still do, that one factor influencing the deafening silence of presidents and administrators was that deep down, they either agreed or had sympathy with the uncompromising hatred of Israel embodied in race and identity-based theories promoted and taught on their campuses and that this was clouding their judgment and moral sensibilities. And second, it became clear to me how spineless many university leaders are. That they no longer saw themselves as moral guides to students, teaching and representing Western enlightened principles of tolerance, peace, coexistence, reason, debate, and free exchange of ideas. Rather, they saw themselves and were hired to keep the peace, raise money, and protect the institution from criticism. But if these are now the primary responsibilities of leadership, why choose academics? with advanced degrees? Why are they more capable of performing these tasks? Do they, by virtue of their academic accomplishments, possess the requisite attributes of leadership, clear thinking, courage, and commitment to principle? Hence, it is not surprising to me that during these very days, Several universities have appeased the most extreme protesters by agreeing to their central demand to launch a process that Northwestern students described as the first meaningful step to divestment from Israel. Why shouldn't we expect this kind of 
lily-livered leadership to buy some months of peace and quiet or the illusion of quiet in exchange for the further degradation of their institutions in the eyes of the American public. The better and more principled approach was announced by the University of Florida. This is not complicated, they said. The University of Florida is not a daycare, and we do not treat protesters like children. They knew the rules, they broke the rules, and they will face the consequence. I know that many of the student protesters who see the human misery in Gaza are motivated to express their pain, whether or not they even know where Gaza is, let alone understand the history of the Middle East. It's legitimate. It's sincere. It's appropriate. But the leaders, the organizers, and the funders of the protests know precisely what they are doing. The reason that these demonstrations inevitably descend into violence is not because of lack of protest discipline. Some wayward activist who goes too far in his speech or actions. The reason that the protests have descended into violence is that their cause is violent. The reason that the protests have descended into outrageous anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is that the Palestinian cause is suffused with anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. The reason we see expressions of extremism is that the cause is extreme. And worse, this extremism is supported by a substantial number of faculty who are out of the mainstream of American society. According to the most recent Harris Poll conducted last week, 80% of Americans support Israel in its war with Hamas. Four out of five. 67% believe that Israel is trying to avoid civilian casualties. 67% say that NATO has a responsibility to support Israel against Iranian aggression. Now, I want to be very clear. I am a liberal. I believe in and vigorously defend the widest possible berth for free speech. I believe in the value and benefit of protests, especially when it comes to students and young adults. I am not opposed to students voicing opposition to Israeli policies, American policies, or policies of their own universities, for that matter, even if I disagree strongly with their views. A free marketplace of ideas is good for America and is the essential cement of democracy. I do note the irony that so many of those who are so insistent on safe space have created the most unsafe space on their campuses, filled with intimidation, verbal and physical violence, and they think nothing of it. I do note the irony that so many of those so quick to accuse others of apartheid have created what they called liberated zones, separating what they consider the good students from the bad students, the good Jews from the bad Jews, or 
as Congresswoman Omar appallingly said, the pro-genocide Jews from the anti-genocide Jews. And I do note the irony, the tragedy, really, that real genocides and enormous evils are taking place around the world that do not seem to trouble the intersectional crowd at all. There's real genocide today in Sudan. As we speak, over a million Muslims are or have been imprisoned in re-education camps in China. Iran oppresses tens of millions of its own citizens and foments worldwide terrorism. Half a million Syrian Muslims were butchered by Assad. Russia is continuing to savage Ukraine now for the third year. 18 million people are in desperate need for humanitarian assistance in Myanmar. Still, human beings are complicated creatures. We are filled with contradictions. And despite my disdain for those who seek Israel's destruction, if they have a constitutional right to express themselves, it is a right I will defend. But no right is limitless. Your right to free speech cannot impinge on my right to speak or my safety. And remember, universities set their own rules of conduct. Did you see the picture of the huge banner hung from Hamilton Hall in Colombia with the word Intifada emblazoned on it? Did you see that? If not, look it up online and tell me what you feel. Did it remind you of another time? A different period? When banners were hung in public spaces representing extreme, hateful, social theories with Jews being the main target? When you view those obstacles and walls on campuses in the liberated zones, when you see videos of Jewish students trying to get to class or somewhere else on campus, but are physically blocked by a chain of protesters, all tolerated by university administrators. Does it remind you of somewhere else? A different time? A different place? That eventually led to worldwide catastrophe? Segregation on American campuses, tolerated by administrations and defended by American public officials? Is this what we have come to in America? They take liberties and tolerate offenses, slights, and transgressions against the Jewish community. They would never dream of tolerating against any other minority group. And they have done it because we have let them do it. I completely understand and sympathize and share the pain of good people in the sufferings of the Palestinians in Gaza. It is horrendous. It is legitimate to protest and express these feelings, and it is legitimate to demand a ceasefire. But I recoil whenever I see the term pro-Palestinian protesters. There is nothing pro-Palestinian about supporting Hamas. They use their own people as human shields. They brought catastrophe to Gaza. Everyone knew that would be the result on October 7th. I knew it. I'm not a politician. 
or a military theorist. They are the tip of the spear of the Iranian-inspired effort to spread radical Islam around the world. Hamas represents the same Islamist forces who brought down the Twin Towers on 9-11. Several of our own people were killed on that day. Hamas is a disaster for the Palestinians. This war could have ended long ago if Hamas wanted it to end. There was a ceasefire in place on, on October 6th that Hamas broke. Friends, I know you are anxious and concerned about your own safety and the physical and emotional well-being of your children. We have congregants who have worked at universities for years. Some of you are on the faculty. I know that many of you have challenging work environments and that social media is often a cesspool of hate and derision. Know that the only way this will improve, the only way to get out of the mess this country is in, the only way to protect the Jewish community is for you to get more involved. Do something. Do something every day. Be active in whatever circle you participate, alumni groups, not-for-profit organizations, political campaigns, wherever you are, do something to push back. Every little bit counts. Every letter, every email, every withholding of funds, every contact with your children's middle school and high school teachers and administrators, everything matters. I think the Jewish community has been much too passive. We should be out there demonstrating, counter-demonstrating, flooding the media, participating in every local and regional political meeting. You should all march this year in the Israel Day Parade in early June. But at all times, we cannot allow violence to come from our side. We must remain steadfastly nonviolent. First, because that's who we are. And it is the right thing to do. And second, we will lose the support of fellow Americans if we initiate violence. We do not want our fellows to conclude a plague on all your houses. You're all beyond the pale. As Martin Luther King reiterated over and over again, we must not allow creative protest to gen degenerate into physical violence, no matter the provocation. And I urge you to attend the Recharging Reform Judaism Conference here in our synagogue at the end of May. We will address the uncomfortable reality that some of those anti-Israel protesters are Jewish. Hundreds of reform rabbis, cantors, educators, administrators, and lay leaders of our synagogues will begin to grapple with our own inadequacies. Why are so many of those young Jewish protesters graduates and alumni of reform synagogues, reform youth groups, reform summer camps? What did we do wrong? And most importantly, what should we be doing now to instill in our youngsters the core Jewish value without which nothing Jewish makes sense? Ahavat 
Israel. Love, concern, and responsibility for fellow Jews. Since October 7th, I have had moments of intense anger. At other times, I have had this overwhelming sense of disappointment in people from whom I expected much more. But mostly, I'm just sad. Sad for the bloodshed. Sad for the immense trauma and pain of Israelis and Jews worldwide. Sad for Palestinians. And sad for the degradation of American liberalism. But even during these moments, I am hardened by Jewish values. Jews are not a despairing people. Despair is not in our DNA. Even during our darkest moments, we are always life-affirming, always looking up. There are always better days ahead. Mindful of the wholesale destruction of the last century and the blood-curdling threats of this century, we have risen from the ashes over and over again. What enormous forces of will were implanted within us that we could rise time after time. Jewish tradition teaches, on the day that Jerusalem was destroyed, the Messiah was born. It's a stunning and distinctively Jewish idea. The seeds of Jewish renew renewal are planted in the soil of destruction, lying in the wreckage, waiting to be nourished and to sprout again. To look back at Jewish history is to realize that even the greatest civilizations thrived but for a moment in time. Once knocked down, they could not get back up. The distinct, distinctive attribute of the Jews is not that we were knocked down, but that we got up when others could not. Mark Twain wrote this. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then passed away. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts. All things are mortal, but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality?